let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 1. That's where we're going to start. I'm going to be looking at quite a few passages today, but I want to uh, start here in, uh, in a passage that is a resurrection passage, even though it may not uh, seem like it. Uh, we think of Acts as being the church and all of the activities of the church, but it begins with the last, uh, resu- uh, last post-resurrection appearance of Christ on the earth. So that's where we're going to be, the first 11 uh, verses of Acts chapter 1 in just a moment. Now, our message this morning sort of found its start in my mind as I uh, was reading a book that uh, I've come across recently called The Historical Theology for the Church. What it's about is uh, a survey of theological development uh, throughout history and with a view to how it benefits the local church rather than simply uh, being an academic type of subject. And their goal uh, in the book is to emphasize the centrality of the church in God's plan and to challenge the church to be what God planned for it to be. So recently I read this chapter on the doctrine of salvation, especially in the early church. And uh, the the first five centuries really is what it was focusing on. Uh, And it's really remarkable. As I've studied uh, this history of the church uh, over the years, that was a period of tremendous uh, development, many challenges. Of course, in the early days of the church, we had somewhat hostile governments, and so there was persecution. Uh, but in, um, in that period, the church withstood these challenges and came up with orthodox doctrine. So I want to read a quote near the, uh, uh, near the beginning of this chapter. He says this, Christians from the beginning declared the message of salvation found in Christ alone, yet errant views forced early theologians to clarify the unique nature and role of Jesus Christ in salvation. In fact, the driving force of Christian responses to radical teaching was maintaining the biblical message of salvation found in Christ alone. I want to focus on that last sentence. In fact, the driving force of Christian responses to heretical teaching was the maintaining was maintaining the biblical message of salvation found in Christ alone. Now, as you read the history of this period, there were very intense battles within the church over doctrine. And uh, theological battles today can also be intense. Uh, For some people, they're off-putting. They seem unchristian. However, what that uh, quote, and then as you read the history of it, The quote highlights something, and then reading the history reinforces the idea that the issue was, what is salvation? And uh, and so uh, there was, in the early church, in in that century, those centuries, one of the battles was over a single letter. It was more than, the whole theological framework was more than that, but one... Uh, one word was spelled with an I in it, and another word was spelled without the I in it. And the fight was over whether to include the I or not to include the I. Now that might seem a little petty and a little bit small, and sometimes theological battles can seem that way. However, today... We are gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ as our resurrected Savior and God. We say that he is the only way to eternal life, to salvation. Without him, you can't be born again. You will never see heaven. So if Jesus is that important to our salvation, the battles over his person are most important. As I mentioned, our text today involves the last post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. Uh, perhaps it would be call, better to call it the post-resurrection disappearance because this is the time of the ascension as the Lord uh, rose uh, to go to be with the Father in heaven. 
Now I'm going to read, uh, actually I think I'm going to read from verse 6. I'm not going to read the first five verses. We'll read verse 6 through 11, and then I'm going to concentrate on verse 11 as we begin. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently, Into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now, I have in my notes as well the King James of that passage, because my mind, I've memorized this verse in the King James. And so it goes this way, which also said, these men in white, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So I took my title for this message from that text, from the King James version of our text. Uh, In the New American, it says, this Jesus. Uh, They mean the same thing, but the King James adds, this same Jesus. Uh, It seems to add a little oomph uh, to the importance of the one whose return we are awaiting. And I put in my notes, oomph is one of those theological words that I think you should be familiar with. So this same Jesus Uh, The Savior we are waiting for, this is our proposition, the Savior we are waiting for is the same Savior who left the company of the apostles 2,000 years ago. And so as we think about this same Jesus, I want to think about the three primary areas that were the subject of the theological battles of the first five centuries of the church. Now, partly this is a lesson in church history. But it's not just a lesson in church history. It's a lesson on what is essential for us to believe in order to be uh, Christians, in order to be born again, in order to be part of the Lord's church. So the first thing, this same Jesus. Well, I want to talk about one of the very first battles that was fought, and it was the battle over the humanity of Jesus Christ. So the man, uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, the, precious, the precious doctrine of the Incarnation. We celebrate at Christmas, God made flesh. We celebrate that God came uh, uh, and created a miracle in the womb of Mary. Uh, a, a baby was being formed, and in that baby was the union of God and man. But he was literally born of the Virgin Mary as a real man. That's the point of this uh, part of doctrine. I'm going to read three verses that, uh, in, that state this. For example, John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then another one from 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God, and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And notice that uh, phrase, the man, Christ Jesus. And then 1 John 1, 1, which is the, uh, the Apostle John's personal testimony to who he's talking about. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. What John means to say is that he was a real person whom we were able to embrace, who were able uh, to take his hand, who were able to fellowship with on a personal basis. In the early years of the church, one of the threats that came, in fact the first threat that came to the orthodox doctrine of salvation was something called doceticism. It's uh, It's not something that's well known, but 
Uh, the quote uh, from the book says, The first major threat to the Christian understanding of Jesus in the first and second centuries was docetism. Maybe I'm saying that wrong. Docetism challenged the Christian affirmation that Jesus was the true incarnation of God by denying that Jesus was genuinely human. Now, doceticism, the word, comes from a Greek word which means to appear or to seem. And so they taught that Jesus was not fully human or only appeared as a man. There's Even today there have been people who have suggested this, that he was some kind of an apparition, wasn't really a man, he just looked like a man, uh, and he appeared that way uh, sort of uh, to fool people, I guess, or to communicate with people. And it was connected with the Gnostic idea. You've heard me talk about Gnosticism. It was connected with the Gnostic idea that matter is evil. This comes from Greek philosophy, that, that the world was unclean, the world was evil, matter was evil, and the highest plane was the spiritual realm. So, uh, so therefore, their notion was that, that God couldn't possibly have come and become a part of this evil uh, physical world. Well, this, this false teaching was countered by men like Ignatius and Irenaeus and others. Ignatius, for example, argued that denial of the true humanity of Jesus negated the salvation Jesus came to bring. And that's absolutely true. If you don't have a man uh, who uh, becomes the substitute for fallen men, you have no way for the wrath of God to be poured out upon sin. John 1.14, as I read earlier, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 1.14, we have uh, Jesus fully participating in the realm of creation, as one commentary says. The eternal Word became human, truly human. That's what that verse is teaching. In 1 Timothy 2.5, where it talks about there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6 goes on to say, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. The idea of a mediator is someone who stands in between. If you're having a, uh, um, you know, a contract dispute, sometimes in uh, workplaces, a mediator will step in. It'll be a third party in between the two parties of labor and management, and the mediator will negotiate back and forth. Well, in a sense, it's not exactly a negotiation, but it is, it is through Jesus Christ that the eternal life of salvation is mediated to human beings. Jesus is providing, to mediate salvation, Jesus is providing salvation manward and facilitating prayer Godward. In other words, he opens the way for you and I to pray to God to receive salvation. Uh, So emphasizing his humanity, Jesus then stands as the new man to replace sinning Adam as head of a new faithful race. John 1.1, as I read earlier also, what was from the beginning, I told you that uh, John gives his personal testimony to his own direct encounter with the man who saves us. As we think about those 11 disciples on the uh, top of the uh, Mount of Olives, for watching Jesus uh, disappear and recede from their view, I'm sure it was a day uh, somewhat like today, bright and clear, and as they watch, he's rising, becomes a speck in the sky, and, and is wa- uh, uh, obscured perhaps by a cloud eventually. Uh, what Uh, What could be the object of their resurrection hope but the man, Christ Jesus? Remember what it says. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, this same Jesus, as the King James says, who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And so what do we look for? First of all, we put our faith in a man, Jesus Christ. We, we are born again by believing in that man. But we look also for that man to return one day to this earth and to bring about full redemption 
and the end of sin and the end of strife and the end of trouble, this same Jesus, the man from Nazareth, will appear at the appointed time, bringing salvation with him. So that's the first area of dispute, and it's an important part of our understanding of this same Jesus. The second uh, controversy that swept up in the church about the Lord Jesus Christ was a controversy about his deity. And I have entitled this point, My Lord and My God. I'm taking that from uh, what Thomas said as he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ, John 20, 28. Jesus, uh, Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and My God. And then John, at the beginning of his gospel, John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And then Colossians 2.9, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Hebrews 1 verse 3, And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things. By the word of his power, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. These verses all speak about the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that has been long under attack, beginning in the second century. Uh, uh, In those days, there was a sect that grew up called the Ebionites. And they believed Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, Messiah, but they denied his divinity. Now, major figures of the early church championed orthodoxy on this point. Justin Martyr, you may have heard his name before, a man named Athenagoras, uh, another named Tatian, Irenaeus, who we mentioned earlier, and others. They argued for the deity based on a couple of things. First of all, the apostolic precedent. This is what the apostles taught, the doctrine of the apostles that persisted to their day, as we've seen in these verses that we've read. And the notion that salvation depends on the union of God with humanity. If Jesus was just a man, how could he give to those who follow him eternal life? You see, it's essential that he be man to be our representative, but it's also essential that he be God in order to give us eternal life and to forgive us of our sins. And so, uh, all of those verses point to that. Thomas's statement, as he uh, had earlier said, my Lord and my God, he was one of those 11 standing with the 10, watching on the Mount of Olives. As the Lord Jesus receded from their view, what could be the object of his hope of resurrection uh, someday, other than the man God, the God man, Christ Jesus? They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, this same Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This same Jesus, the Lord from heaven, will appear at the appointed time, bringing salvation with him. And so we've talked about the controversy about Jesus' humanity, and about his deity. There was one final major controversy. I'm sure there are little controversies along the way. It doesn't seem like devil, the devil will attack the church uh, almost daily and try to distract it from its message. But the third major controversy was the controversy over the Trinity. I've given this point the title, I and the Father are one. The doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, here's an expression of the Trinity in that, commi- in that great commission as Jesus spoke to his disciples. Now, <clears throat> the Trinity is not something that is as explicitly taught as the humanity of and deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, the fact that the Lord Jesus is presented as God, and the fact that the Lord Jesus is uh, distinct from uh, from the Father, means that something has to be understood 
in order to be, for God to be one, as the scriptures also uh, uh, teach. The challenge of the Trinity is an ongoing challenge even to this day. And as I said, it's mixed up with the controversy over the deity of Christ. The most well-known opponent of this doctrine was a man named Arius in the 4th century. And that controversy culminated in the Council of Nicaea. This is where the battle over the letter I occurred. Arius taught, there was once when he was not. In other words, uh, he was not the son. He was not a, uh, connected. There was a point in which he was, didn't even exist. In other words, he's a created being. He taught he was like God, but he was not fully God. It's his teaching, the teaching of Arius, is very similar, in fact, to the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses to this day. His term was, I'm going to give you the Greek here, homoiousios. Homoiousios. So, so the homoi, the I there, that creates that sound, it means similar in nature. Now, the most well-known champion of the Trinity was a man named Athanasius of Alexandria. He fought for his term, homoousios, not homoousios, homoousios. He said, we don't need that letter I. It communicates something entirely wrong. What homoousios, without the I, means is same in substance. The same in substance. Somebody told Athanasius on one occasion, don't you know, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. And Athanasius is reported to have said, well, then it is I, Athanasius, against the whole world. And he was standing up for the orthodox doctrine of the church. He suffered exile from his office as Bishop of Alexandria five times during his ministry as a part of this fight. But the victory for orthodoxy was secured in Nicaea and the Nicene Creed. Now, the fact is, our salvation rests in the secure arms of the triune God. It is the Father who plans salvation and bestows it upon us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Son who accomplished salvation by his death, burial, and resurrection. And it is the Spirit who applies its benefits to the heart and life. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so now as we think again of the eleven, they are standing on the Mount of Olives. As the Lord Jesus is receding from their view, they are shortly to receive in Jerusalem, in just ten days from that experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What could be the object of their resurrection hope but the promise of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? They said also, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, this same Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This same Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, will appear at the appointed time, bringing salvation with him. The proposition again, the Savior we are waiting for is the same Savior who left the company of the apostles 2,000 years ago. When the apostle John had a vision of the man he last saw on the Mount of Olives in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. He saw a man. Now, he was an unusual man, such a man. His face was shining like the sun. His feet were shimmering like burnished bronze. He, is, he was the resurrected and glorified God-man, the Son of God, who gave us his spirit, and will return on the day the Father appointed. This Easter morning, as we think about our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, we think about the promise of salvation, of sins forgiven, and the hope of heaven. We think about 
uh, His return. He made a promise on that day, and we trust that one of these days, when this world has run its course, and the battles uh, of man against God are going to come to their end, that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the man from heaven, will come and will put things right in this earth. We pray today, even so, Lord Jesus, come, as John said at the end of uh, the book of Revelation. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. We look for him. We believe in him. We put our faith in him. And he's our God and he's our king. And we pray that his return will come soon. May the Lord bless you as you think about our Lord Jesus Christ as you worship him this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he paid the price of our sin on the hill of Calvary. We thank you for all that you've done for us through him. We pray that you help us to be faithful to him day by day as we go through this time of, uh, of uncertainty and fear. Lord, I pray that you will bring about uh, your blessing uh, on us as we worship you uh, today together and uh, as a church. Uh, Lord, we do pray that we'll soon be able to... Uh, uh, have free worship, completely free, and uh, be past this time of uh, pandemic. Lord, we pray for your blessing. Guide us now as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you.